Section 1 of The Adventures of Old Man Coyote. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois. The Adventures of Old Man Coyote by Thornton W. Burgess. Chapter 1 The Strange Voice. Listen. It was Jimmy Skunk speaking. He had just met Peter Rabbit halfway down the crooked little path just where the moonlight was brightest. But he did not need to tell Peter to listen. Peter was listening, listening with all his might. He was sitting up very straight, and his long ears were turned in the direction of the strange sound. Just then it came again, a sound such as neither Peter Rabbit nor Jimmy Skunk had ever heard before. Peter's teeth began to chatter. Wha, wha, what is it? he whispered. I don't know, unless it is Hooty the Owl gone crazy, replied Jimmy. No, said Peter, it isn't Hooty the Owl. Hooty never could make such a noise as that. Maybe it's Dippy the Loon. I've heard him on the big river, and he sounds just as if he had gone crazy replied jimmy no said peter looking behind him nervously no it isn't dippy the loon for dippy never leaves the water and that voice came from the green meadows i wouldn't be surprised peter didn't finish for just then the strange voice sounded again and it was nearer than before never had the green meadows or the green forest heard anything like it it sounded something like Hooty the Owl, and a Dippy the Loon, and two or three little dogs howling all together. And there was something in the sound that made cold chills run up and down Peter Rabbit's backbone. He crept a little closer to Jimmy Skunk. I believe it is Farmer Brown's boy and some of his friends laughing and shouting together, said Jimmy. No, it isn't. The Farmer Brown's boy and his friends can make some dreadful noises, but nothing so dreadful as that. It makes me afraid, Jimmy Skunk, said Peter. Pooh, you're afraid of your own shadow, replied Jimmy Skunk, who isn't afraid of much of anything. Let's go down there and find out what it is. Peter's big eyes grew rounder than ever with fright at the very thought. Don't you think of such a thing, Jimmy Skunk? Don't you think of such a thing? He chattered. I know it's something terrible. Oh, dear, I wish I were safe at home in the dear old briar patch. Again sounded the strange voice. Or was it voices? It seemed sometimes as if there were two or three together. Then again it sounded like only one. Each time Peter Rabbit crept a little closer to Jimmy Skunk. Pretty soon even Jimmy began to feel a little uneasy. "'I'm going home,' said he suddenly. "'I want to, but I don't dare to,' said Peter, shaking all over with fright. "'Pooh! Anyone who can run as fast as you can ought not to be afraid,' said Jimmy. "'But if you really are afraid, you can come up to my house.' "'Oh, thank you, Jimmy Skunk. I believe I will come sit on your doorstep, if you don't mind." So together they went up to Jimmy Skunk's house, and sat on his doorstep in the moonlight, and listened to the strange voice all the long night. And then, when he saw old Mother Westwind coming down from the purple hills in the early dawn, Peter Rabbit became courageous enough to start for his home in the dear old briar-patch. Chapter Two. Peter Rabbit's Run for Life It was very, very early in the morning when Old Mother West Wind came down from the purple hills with her big bag, and out of it emptied her children, the merry little breezes, to play on the green meadows. Peter Rabbit, watching her from the doorstep of Jimmy Skunk's house, felt his courage grow. All the night long he and Jimmy Skunk had sat on the doorstep listening to a strange voice. A terrible voice, Peter had thought. But with the first light of the coming day, the voice had been heard no more, 
And now, as Peter watched Old Mother West Wind just as he had done so often before, he began to wonder if that dreadful voice hadn't been a bad dream. So he bade Jimmy Skunk good-bye, and started for his home in the dear old briar-patch. He wanted to run just as fast as he knew how, but he didn't. No, sir, he didn't. That is, not while he was in sight of Jimmy Skunk. You see, he knew that Jimmy would laugh at him. He wasn't brave enough to be laughed at. The bravest boy is not the one who does some mighty deed, who risks his very life perchance to serve another's need. The bravest boy is he who dares to face the scornful laugh for doing what he knows is right, though others mock and chaff. But as soon as Peter was sure that Jimmy Skunk could no longer see him, he began to hurry and the nearer he got to the old briar-patch, the faster he hurried. He would run a little way as fast as he could, lipperty-lipperty-lip, and then stop and look and listen nervously. Then he would do it all over again. It was one of these times when he was listening that Peter thought he heard a soft footstep behind him. It sounded very much like the footstep of Reddy Fox. Peter crouched down very low and sat perfectly still, holding his breath and straining his ears. There it was again. Pit-a-pat, pit-a-pat, very soft and coming nearer. Peter waited no longer. He sprang forward with a great leap and started for the dear old briar-patch as fast as he could go, which, you know, is very fast indeed. As he ran, he saw behind him a fierce, grinning face. It was very much like the face of Reddy Fox, only larger and fiercer and gray instead of red. Never in all his life had Peter run as he did now, for he knew that he was running for his life. It seemed as if those long legs of his hardly touched the ground. He didn't dare try any of the tricks with which he had so often fooled Reddy Fox, for he didn't know anything about this terrible stranger. He might not be fooled by tricks as Reddy Fox was. Peter began to breathe hard. It seemed to him that he could feel the hot breath of the fierce stranger. And right down inside, Peter somehow felt sure that this was the owner of the strange voice which had so frightened him in the night. Snap! That was a pair of cruel jaws right at his very heels. It gave Peter new strength, and he made longer jumps than before. The dear old briar-patch, the safe old briar-patch, was just ahead. With three mighty jumps, Peter reached the opening of one of his own private little paths and dived in under a bramble-bush. And even as he did so, he heard the clash of sharp teeth and felt some hair pulled from his tail. And then, outside the old briar-patch, broke forth that same terrible voice Peter had heard in the night. Peter didn't stop to look at the stranger, but hurried to the very middle of the old briar-patch, and there he stretched out at full length and panted and panted for breath. CHAPTER Three. Reddy Fox Makes a Discovery Reddy Fox had boasted that he was not afraid of the unknown stranger who had frightened Peter Rabbit so, and whose voice in the night had brought the great fear to the green meadows and the green forest. But Reddy Fox is always boasting, and a boaster is seldom very brave. Right down deep in his heart, Reddy was afraid. What he was afraid of he didn't know. That is one reason that he was afraid. He is always afraid of things that he doesn't know about. Old Granny Fox had taught Reddy that. If you are afraid of things you don't know all about, and just keep away from them, they never will hurt you, said wise old Granny Fox. And that is one reason that Farmer Brown's boy had never been able to catch her in a trap. But Granny was too smart to boast that she wasn't afraid when she was, while Reddy was forever bragging of how brave he was, when all the time he was one of the greatest cowards among all the little meadow and forest people. When he had first heard that strange voice, 
little cold chills had chased each other up and down his backbone, just as they had with nearly all the others who had heard it, and Reddy had not gone hunting that night. But Reddy has a big appetite, and a hungry stomach doesn't let one think of much else. So after a day or two, Reddy grew brave enough to go hunting. Somehow he had a feeling that it was safer to hunt during the day instead of during the night. You see, it was only after jolly, round, red Mr. Sun had gone to bed behind the purple hills that that strange voice was heard, and Reddy guessed that perhaps the stranger slept during the day. So Reddy started out very early in the morning, stepping as softly as he knew how, looking behind every bush and tree and with his sharp little ears wide open to catch every sound. Every few feet he stopped and sniffed the wind very carefully, for Reddy's nose can tell him of things which his eyes do not see, and his ears do not hear. And all the time he was ready to run at the first sign of danger. He had left the green forest and was out on the green meadows, hoping to catch Danny Meadow Mouse, when that sharp little nose of his was tickled by one of the merry little breezes with a smell that Reddy knew. Reddy turned and went in the direction from which the merry little breeze had come. Just a few steps he went, and then he stopped and sniffed. Um, said Reddy to himself, that smells to me like chicken. It certainly does smell like chicken. Very, very slowly and carefully, Reddy moved forward in the direction from which that delicious smell came. Every few steps he stopped and sniffed. Sniff, sniff, sniff. Yes, it certainly was chicken. Reddy's mouth watered. A few more steps, and there, a little way in front of him, partly hidden in a clump of tall grass and bushes, lay a half-eaten chicken. Reddy stopped short and sat down to look at it. Then he looked all around it to see if there was any one about. Then he walked clear around it in a circle, but he was very careful not to go too near. Finally he sat down again where he could smell the chicken. His tongue hung out with longing, and water dripped from the corners of his mouth. His stomach said, Go get it, but his head said, don't go any nearer. It may be some sort of a trap. Then Reddy remembered one of the sayings of wise old Granny Fox. When you are tempted very much, just turn your back and go away. Temptation then can harm you not, but only those who choose to stay. I hate to do it, but I guess it's the best way, said Reddy Fox, and turned his back on the chicken and trotted away. Chapter 4. Reddy Fox Consults Bobby Coon When Reddy Fox had turned his back on the half-eaten chicken that he had found hidden in a bunch of grass and bushes on the green meadows, it had been the hardest thing to do that Reddy could remember, for his stomach fairly ached he was so hungry. But there might be danger there, and it was best to be safe. So Reddy turned and trotted away where he could neither see nor smell that chicken. He caught some grasshoppers, and he found a family of fat beetles. They were not very filling, but they were better than nothing. After a while he felt better, and he curled up in a warm sunny spot to rest and think. It may be that Farmer Brown's boy has set a trap there, said Reddy to himself. Then he remembered that the chicken was half eaten, and he knew that it wasn't likely that Farmer Brown's boy would have a half eaten chicken unless he found one that Jimmy Skunk had left near the henyard, and for some reason he didn't know, he had a feeling that Jimmy Skunk had not had anything to do with that chicken. The more he thought about it, the more he felt sure that that chicken had something to do with the stranger whose voice had brought so much fear to the green meadows. The very thought made him nervous and spoiled his sunbath. I believe I'll run over and see Bobby Coon said Reddy, and off he started for the green forest. Bobby Coon had been out all night, and he had not been very far away from his hollow tree, because he too had felt little chills of fear when he had heard that strange voice, which wasn't the voice of Hooty the Owl, or of Dippy the Loon, 
or of a little yelping dog, and yet sounded something like all three together. So Bobby's stomach wasn't as full as usual, and he felt cross and uncomfortable. You know, it is hard work to feel hungry and pleasant at the same time. He had just begun to doze when he heard Reddy Fox calling softly at the foot of the tree. "'Bobby! Bobby Coon!' called Reddy. Bobby didn't answer. He kept perfectly still to try to make Reddy think that he was asleep. But Reddy kept right on calling. Finally, Bobby scrambled up to the doorway of his house in the big hollow tree and scowled down at Reddy Fox. "'Well, what is it?' he snapped crossly. You ought to be ashamed of yourself to disturb people who are trying to get a little honest sleep. Reddy grinned. I'm very sorry to wake you up, Bobby Coon, said Reddy, but you see, I want your advice. I know that there is no one smarter than you, and I have just discovered something very important about which I want to know what you think. The scowl disappeared from Bobby Coon's face. He felt very much flattered, just as Reddy meant that he should feel, and he tried to look very important and wise, as he said, "'I'm listening, Reddy Fox. What is it that is so important?' Then Reddy told him about the half-eaten chicken over on the green meadows, and how he suspected that the stranger with the terrible voice had had something to do with it. Bobby listened gravely. "Pooh," said he. "'Probably Jimmy Skunk knows something about it.' "'No,' replied Reddy. "'I'm sure that Jimmy Skunk doesn't know anything about it. "'Come over with me and see it for yourself.' Bobby began to back down into his house. "'You'll have to excuse me this morning, Reddy Fox. "'You see, I'm very tired and need sleep,' said he. Reddy turned his head aside to hide a smile for he knew that Bobby was afraid. "'I'm sure it must have been Jimmy Skunk,' continued Bobby. "'Why don't you go ask him? I never like to meddle with other people's business.' And with that, Bobby Coon backed down out of sight in the hollow tree. End of Section 1